Hello, and welcome back to another episode of It's Always Sunny in Hollywood, where today, we drive. That's literally the name of the movie, Drive. Uh, I, I guess I'm your Uber, in a sort, Lugia, and with me uh, are... Just call me the driver. <laughs> this movie is a biopic, a biopic about me. And I guess I'm Patrick the... Oh yeah, I'm drummer too, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm drummer. Okay. Uh, Patrick, I don't, Pat doesn't know. <laughs> Just like me, for real me. So, uh, we'll, we'll get into the full feature film of ourselves in a little bit, but we got some news to take care of real quick. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm trying to beatbox. I don't know. I've never beatboxed in my life. Um, yeah, anyway, people, uh, everyone's favorites beatboxer verbalace is in the news today he's uh, best known for his a uh, cartoon beatboxing um the cartoon uh what's it called Lisbon hotel no verbalace is series it's like called cartoon beatboxing battles or some shit let me let me double check cartoon... i don't know i just know i just know this leads into Hasbun hotel somehow okay yeah cartoon beatbox uh battle so a while back verbalace he uh, put up a Patreon and, like, a PayPal to get more episodes of his show um, funded. And he decided that instead of spending the money on his show, he's going to take the 50k he generated and um, use it to uh, commission softcore porn of him and Charlie from Hasbun Hotel. It's a video of Charlie from Hasbun Hotel basically doing a strip tease for him and then fucking him. Um, softcore, though. And yeah, it's just kind of insane. So, uh, his credibility's probably going down the drain now. Like, th this all happened, like, a few days ago, too. And it's just exploded. How did it even, like, get out? Because apparently it's not, like, a public video. Well, I'm pretty sure it was uploaded and then it was removed. But I don't think it was, like, uploaded by him. I think, like, the animator uploaded it and then people were like, wait a second, is that fucking verbalized? <laughs> I think that's what happened, which is... Hilarious to me. What's funny is like I'm not percent so sure that like Charlie's character is gay or something. I don't know. Anyway, this is a wild uh, way um, for Hasbun Hotel to be in the news because the first like th the show actually started like a few days ago, and now everyone is just talking about Verbalize and not the actual show. Do you guys remember cartoon beatboxing battles? You guys ever seen episode? Uh, not of that show in particular. I mean, I have seen, like, epic rap battles of history, but, well, well for one, that's not animated, and two, that's yeah. something else I never entirely. Actually, I never really watched them, either. I just saw clips, like, on Twitter sometimes, because people are, like, cracking jokes about it, but yeah. But, uh, speaking of things that have kind of e exploded, uh, Sonic Prime, I know we've briefly went over, uh, this show before. Um, I don't think we've seen it, right? None of us have seen Sonic Prime? I yeah. no, I haven't. Seen it. Okay, I haven't. What I find interesting is that when the first season came out, people actually really liked it, and then by the time you get to the third season, uh, people are just like, just kill the fucking show already. And I'm like, what? Here's the thing. What happened here? Here's the thing. I understand, uh, not much actually happened. It's just more of like, um, people just kind of like realized the show wasn't that good. Like, it's more of, like, people were just, like, overly nice to it because it wasn't, like, immediately terrible. But then, like, it, when it settled with people, they're like, this show is actually, like, really fucking bland. At least that's, like, what I've been hearing. I heard it's so, been yeah. getting repetitive where, like, Sonic's trying to convince, like, a different version of Tails. Like, you're my buddy. Don't be evil. No. How? Just don't be evil. No. Come on. Please don't be evil. All right, bet. Or shit like that. I don't know. Again, I haven't seen the show for myself, but I heard it gets like really, really repetitive by the third season. And also in that third season, there is a sprite animation going around from the official show, mind you, of Sonic and Tails in Sunset Hill from Sonic Advance 3 fighting the Eggman boss in Sonic Advance 3 with a general cameo that was completely unintentional. Yeah, so basically, the, the animation itself is not very good. It looks, like, completely off. But even, like, besides that, yeah. Uh, for some reason, they made, like, original sprites for Sonic and Tails, but they just, like, copied 
one of the boss sprites from Sonic Advance 3, and um, they did not realize, because I guess they didn't play the game, that um, Drumroll is not just a part of the machine, he's like a character. <laughs> so Drumroll's head is just on the machine that they fight, and it's really funny. And then it explodes, and Drumroll dies as Eggman gets away. What I find weird is that they don't use the Sonic Advance sprites for Sonic and Tails, they just modify the Genesis ones. Yeah, like, it's also kind of weird that some people forgot that, um, like, classic Sonic looks nothing like modern Sonic. They gave him green like they both eyes. Got, they, but they both got some attitude, but, like, that's it. What's the other piece of news I had? Oh, yeah, Young Sheldon. So Young Sheldon finally showed the origin of Bazinga, and what's really funny is that it's not that bad. Like, you would think that would be, like, a corny Han Solo moment, but here's the thing. One of the key things about Sheldon's character is that he is deeply autistic. And, like, not that's not a joke. Like, he's actually autistic. Like, that was the intent. They write him as autistic. They play him as autistic. And uh, from what I heard, the, the origin of Bazinga is actually... A lot of, like, autistic people are saying that it's actually, like... Uh, what's it called? Like, a, a decent portrayal of autism, I guess? Like, like they're saying that it, it fits. So, let me basically explain it. Basically, he sees this, like, ad... For like this novelty joke company, he sees the word bazinga. He thinks the word bazinga is funny, and then the company's tagline is, "If it's funny, it's a bazinga." So basically, he's treating the product slogan as a fact because he's like a socially awkward autistic kid. And I guess a lot of people are like, "Oh yeah, him just kind of like not really getting it." And but like the specific way he doesn't get it is apparently like a lot of autistic people are like, "Oh yeah, like I've I've had that feeling when I was like." that age and i was like oh okay cool so if it's funny it's a bazinga anyway that was it for this week's uh deep serious lore analysis of young sheldon tune in next week where we uh analyze why han's last name is solo i don't know drive 2011 all right so drive was directed by nicholas winding refin i hope i'm pronouncing that right it stars ryan gosling Carrie Mulligan, Brian Cranston, Christina Hendricks, and Oscar Isaac. Uh, this movie had a budget of $15 million and made a little over $81 million, so it was pretty big at the time. Uh, and just a couple fun facts. This was based on a book written by James Salas. I am completely unfamiliar with the book. Uh, you guys haven't read it, right? No, I didn't even know this was based on a book. It's kind of weird, like, we talk about a lot of movies that are based on books. Like, we had American Psycho, uh, among the, other The things. majority of films are based on... Listen, there are so many movies based on books that the Oscars has a separate category for original screenplays and adaptive screenplays, because there are so many adaptions. Did not know this was based on a book, though, and the fact that I don't know makes me think that it's probably either different or way better. So wonder if one of the other Drive movies were... This isn't the first movie called Drive, so like I'm wondering if... Okay, we'll see. Okay, uh, in my giant list of book adaptations that I have on Letterboxd, I did include Drive. So I guess at a certain point, I did know it was a book adaptation, and I just forgot. Oops. Maybe, maybe one day we'll read it, I don't know. I've always heard people call, um, what's it we call it, Hotline Miami, the drive of um, video games. So there's a lot of Drive-influenced stuff, and like John I can kind of see like, it, yeah. It has that uh, cool. 80s aesthetic. People think Hotline Miami is like Drive mixed with John Wick. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably accurate. So once Drive was greenlit for production, the producers chose Ryan Gosling for the lead role, like very early on, right on the spot. And something interesting about that choice was that Gosling would also be allowed to choose the director for the film. And immediately he said Nicholas Winding Refn. And to quote him on his choice, he said, it had to be him. There was no other choice. And that got me wondering, who else would match the tone of what the movie's going for, if at all? Michael Mann. That's all I got, Michael Mann. That's maybe it. uh, maybe Walter Hill, because he already made a movie called Driver, which was it's just basically like the same flick, so... 
Everyone I think of are like old school, like 70s, 80s directors. Maybe Paul Schrader, the guy who wrote Taxi Driver, he also made a couple like kind of moody uh, flicks like this, like uh, American, yeah, American Gigolo and Light Sleeper. So I'd say he would probably be a good fit. To be fair, every director I mentioned like basically stopped working, with the exception of Schrader, but Schrader would, didn't have the kind of profile he did in 2011 anymore. Honestly, I can't, I can't really think of any. You've never seen any of his other movies, right? I've never seen only. Before this. I've seen only God Forgives, which is the follow-up to Drive. Um, in some ways, some people would argue it's kind of a spiritual successor, but also kind of like a deconstruction of Drive because um, basically, it almost seems like only God Forgives feels like Nicholas Winding Refn saw the response to Drive and basically like didn't like the response. So yeah, it's a, Only God Forgives is an interesting movie. I'm not sure if I'd call it a good movie, but it's an interesting movie. Uh, looking over his filmography, I do not recognize any movies here. I've heard of Bronson and Valhalla Rising. I just haven't seen them. And The Neon Demon. I've heard of, like, I've heard of these movies. I just The only ones I've seen are Drive and Only God Forgives. So once Refn got a hold of the script, uh, something that I found interesting was that he enjoyed the split personality of the main character rather than the actual plot itself. Maybe he saw a little bit of himself in uh, the driver character. Who knows? Yeah, maybe the driver character was just like him for real. <laughs> and just a couple other things. Brian Cranston being cast as Shannon because of his work in Breaking Bad as Walter White because, like, uh, obviously... Brian Cranston is known for his work as Walter White. And uh, Albert Brooks, who played Bernie in the film, uh, wanted to go against his type, and he thought that Bernie wasn't a cliched character, so he happily accepted the role. But that's it. That, I think that's all I got. Yeah, interesting about casting. I, I did think how interesting it was, like how many people kind of played against type. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, like seeing like, you know, Brian Cranston as being more of like the nice, affable guy here. And he, like, he wasn't like, um, you know, Malcolm in the middle and stuff, but like he always played kind of like these like particularly like brand of comedic character. And this I could feel like taps more into like his the kinder side of things. Um, and Albert Brooks, he plays like Woody Allen, like very Jewish, like comedic characters. Woody Allen, you kind of like, you know, his most famous role is the dad from Finding Nemo, the main character of Finding Nemo. <laughs> And, like, his other roles are, like, in Defending My Life and uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm and, like, um, Modern Lo Romance. All those, like, shows are all, like, very kind of classic kind of comedic Jewish characters. So seeing him as this it was, like, fascinating. Um, I especially found it interesting because, you know, um, if you guys remember, he was in Drive. And what I always thought was interesting about his character is that in Drive is that... He f reminded is that his character is basically meant to be like a counterpart to Travis Bickle, like Travis Bickle. If he had like more social sense, where like there, there, there like some parallels between them, and it was like, I, you know, I think I mentioned this in that episode, but like you know, I always thought it was kind of interesting how like, you know, one of his more like significant roles was always kind of playing like a sort of like dark, like had like a son of a bit of underlying darkness, and like he never really got to tap into that again in his career until now, where he got to play like an actual like mobster. I was like, that's kind of cool. And yeah, it's also interesting that, like, you know, you know since we mentioned Brian Cranston, Brian Cranston was a comedic actor who suddenly played, like, a serious dramatic role, and that's what Albert Brooks is here, too. And that's he's what he's supposed to actor. for. Yeah, Bra Albert Brooks is a comedian who um, had this role in one of the most popular movies of all time where he plays an incredibly dark character, and I was like, that's kind of interesting to me. You know, that's kind of cool. Yeah, insane career this man has. It's like, Oh, what's your career? Okay, I'm in Taxi Driver and Drive, and then in between them, I did a bunch of comedies, and also, I'm like one of the most recurring guest actors in The Simpsons, and also I'm in Find I'm the main character of Finding Nemo. <laughs> I was like, what a weird fucking career, man. Oh, also, my brother, I replaced my brother in um, what should I call it? Um, in Curb Your Enthusiasm after he passed away. So like, I was just a main character in Curb Your Enthusiasm for like two seasons. <laughs> what a weird career. Also, also, my name is actually Albert Einstein, but I yeah, changed it because... His, his name is Albert Einstein, yeah. His, bro his brother's yeah, Bob yes. Einstein, to be clear. Yeah, his, his brother's uh, Bob Einstein, who passed away in 2019, so... Yeah. Ivan Brooks, I actually think, is one of like, the most brilliant comedians out there. Like, I think he's like, up there with like, Woody Allen in terms of like one of the best. 
it was funny is like he didn't even like really want to be a comedian. He just kind of fell into comedy. He always wanted to be like you know a kind of actor, writer, director, and uh, he basically just did comedy to pay the bills for the time being. And then when he started making films, I guess he he didn't like Woody Allen kind of built up to making dramedies. Albert Brooks he just kind of like from the get go kind of went with like satire dramedies instead of uh starting out with doing pure comedies and then eventually like building up to it. So I guess that's kind of interesting for him. Kind of shows what his priorities were. But yeah. I'm just using this excuse to talk about, like, one of my favorite comedians. Oh, that's all good. Yeah, It was so, like, fucked up when my dad was like, oh, brother, have you ever seen any of Albert Brooks' other movies? He's like, no. He was like, okay. It was like, it's like, I think, like, the first, like, movie he showed me that wasn't Finding Nemo was Finding Comedy in the Muslim World. And I was like, good lord, man. Another is this Finding movie. movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Looking for comedy in the Muslim world. But yeah, it's like, yeah. Uh, that was a good movie. Um, A bit underrated, honestly. I think that one gets, like, more shit just because, you know, it's, uh... Uh, two, uh, satire in the 2000s was a lot more touchy, but I still think it's pretty good. Um, he's always been like pretty smart with satire. His a movie Lost in America, it's a parody of Easy Rider, and it's meant to sort of lampoon the boomer generation. And I was like, it, technically, it's one of the first times, like the first lampooning of the boomer generation, which I always thought was kind of interesting. Like, yeah, it does some kind of stuff that like Sopranos would do like later. And defending your life is basically like a precursor to um. The Good Place, I actually think it's better than The Good Place because it's more about self-actualization rather than the, the kind of weird systemic thing that The Good Place kind of like, I think, butchered by the end. And Modern Romance is just, in my opinion, one of the greatest like rom-coms of all time because it's uh, completely like, makes fun of how messy things are. And also it's like a really weird side plot where he's working as like an audio engineer and that really has nothing to do with the rest of the film, but it's like, it's funny as fuck, so I don't care. <laughs> anyway. Ryan Gosling. <laughs> right. So, uh, what exactly is the plot of Drive? Or rather, who who is this mysterious man that is supposed to be just like us? Well, uh, if you're a mechanic, a stunt double, a stunt driver, and or a criminal for hire as a getaway driver, uh, congratulations, you have something in common, I guess. So, the driver, which, well, he doesn't have a name in the film, he's, he's called the driver, I'm going to call him Ryan. That just makes it easier for me. Fair enough. So Ryan is a driver. That's what he does. He drives around a lot. And all of his dangerous jobs are handled by one man named Shannon. And then one day, Ryan tests out a race car. And Shannon persuades him to meet with a Jewish American mobster named Bernie and his half-Italian partner, Nino, to purchase the car for a race. However, in between that, uh, Ryan meets a, his neighbor named Irene, whose husband uh, has just gotten out of jail and is in debt for $40,000. So Ryan agrees to help him pay off that debt, only for shit to go south really fast, when he dies during the operation, and it turns out that was all conducted by Nino. So now Ryan has gotten way too deep into this, and he's gonna need to have some blood on his hands. And that's basically Drive, or at least a very, very short summation of it. So what did we think? I guess I'll start. Um, okay, so I had never seen this movie before. I'd only heard of it briefly in passing. I gotta be honest, this is not at all without what I was expecting. Uh, with a title like Drive, I was expecting a lot more car stuff, at, le at least like chases and stunts and action. Yeah, there's like, um, what, two scenes of a. Uh, there's, there's the beginning chase and then there's a chase scene in the middle. So I was like, oh, um, okay. Um, weird flex. Uh, but no, here's, I was expecting something along the lines of, like, Baby Driver, which it kind of is. It's like a low-key Baby Driver. It's much quieter and much slower. Uh, but actually, this movie reminded me a lot more of another movie we've talked about, Punch Drunk Love, of all things. Oh? Because it's mainly a romance film, at least, like, for the first hour. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, it becomes this violent story about repaying debt. And I'm just like, um, Okay. <laughs> So here's a, a funny thing that you mentioned about Baby Driver. So here's the thing. Drive is technically a film in a long lineage of um, 
movies like this, where it's like about um, it's very kind of stripped back films about uh, getaway drivers. The first one is uh, and I think I mentioned before is the driver by Walter Hill. Is probably like the most kind of well known iteration, and that's why most other versions tend to draw from the whole um, getaway driver angle. But it's not like the first one. Less Samurai, I think, is the one that basically created this kind of like sub genre. So yeah, there's Less Samurai. There's this. I think Michael Mann's Thief is considered part of this kind of a uh, g- sub genre. But uh, yeah, this is like an actual like kind of running thing. So it's uh, yeah, I didn't mention Baby Driver, but it's like interesting that you kind of like noticed that that was kind of like part of the genre because it is it is they like open in a very similar way too with the the getaway drive yeah so it's um the driver was cited like directly as the the, the original driver the 1978 version was like directly cited as an influence by both nicholas winding reffin and edgar wright for these two respective films it's weird because i said i expected like a more actiony movie for the first hour it's not that and then it is that, and I was, like, thrown, so thrown for a loop, because, like, the first hour of the movie is so, like, slow and, you know, just focused methodical. on the characters. Yeah, slow and methodical. And then it suddenly becomes really gory, and, like, that's kind of what I expected, but I was still so thrown for a loop when it happened, because it was so unlike the rest of the movie. In the end, I was just like, okay. Like, you want to know my thoughts on this movie? My, my end thought is, that is not what I expected. It's just the, my general gist. I, this is not what I expected it to be. I mean, I liked it, but I'm also kind of confused. I think that's yeah, I always kind of took it as more like because yeah. of how uh, Ryan Gosling's always, character is portrayed with his split yeah, I personality. I always felt that there was like that there was like a very like kind of bubbling kind of like darkness underneath him. Like he's like unassuming on the surface. He's trying to be nice, but like I always felt like there was like something underneath the surface was kind of wrong about him it kind of like burst out during the elevator scene because let, let's be real the elevator scene that's like the big turning point of the film right yeah that or when oscar yeah. isaac gets shot like those are the two scenes where i'm like oh fuck what the hell yeah it's kind of interesting it's kind of a cute little kind of like simple romance story but also kind of about like violence and stuff i always saw like baby drivers more of like again like all these movies are basically just kind of remakes of the driver um, but I always felt like this one was more of like trying to take it more to like its logical extreme in terms of like how stark it is. Um, and like that's more of like 70s thing and like a lot of like the 80s versions are a lot, a lot more slick. I feel like this is like trying to take like kind of the 80s slickness, but the emotional line of the 70s and then like really distill it down to like the bare essentials. And Baby Driver I feel like is more trying to be like a more pop kind of like fun iteration of it. Yeah, Baby Driver so, yeah. feels a lot more modern. This one definitely tried going for the 80s aesthetic, at least in terms of the music and art direction. It's like it's supposed yeah. to be set in modern times though, like present day. But it still yeah. goes for that 80s soundtrack. Yeah, and I think that that's probably just influenced from like, you know, the Paul Schrader or like Michael Mann derived kind of like spiritual successors. Um I'm not sure what would be considered like the first in this kind of genre, by the way. It's uh Maybe Pickpocket by Robert Brisson. Robert Brisson's got like a very similar kind of stripped back style. I know like Pickpocket is like Paul Schrader's favorite movie, but like I don't know. Going back to Ryan Gosling's character, how much of yourself did you see in him? In all seriousness, not that much. I just thought yeah. I was like it's just kind of funny. <laughs> oh, by the way, unrelated. Have you guys ever played that video game Driver? Uh, like the 1999 no. PlayStation game? No, I have not. Okay, it's pretty good, and also apparently it was inspired by. Uh, the original driver, but like as a result, it kind of feels like a drive video game. So like you know, we mentioned Hotline Miami, but Driver 1999 is also a drive video game. I kind of liked how uh, Ryan had like a like few lines. Like he still talked, but he was like a man of few words. And like every time he talked, he did it in like this monotone voice. Like he'll he'll still have facial expressions. He'll smile. He'll get angry. But like. It's clear that, like, something is bugging him. Yeah, I, I guess I don't have, like, much to say about this. It's more of, like, a, a formal exercise more than anything, because, like, it's very stripped back. I feel like this movie's, like, been secretly very influential, because I feel like a lot of, like, A24 movies tried doing a similar kind of, like, very stark and stripped back thing to it. And, like, I know Denny Villeneuve, he, he definitely tries doing that. You know, there's a reason why, like, Blade Runner 2049 um, has a very similar kind of fan base to Drive. Like, I'd, I'd honestly kind of say, like, Blade Runner 2049 is almost, like, like the sci-fi drive in a way. Because, like, Ryan Gosling's character is very similar, too. And 
You know, so I guess maybe Denny Villeneuve probably could have done this, but you know, I guess he did. Strong performances, strong soundtrack, pretty well shot. I like the editing. Um, I like how um, it's so stark that it makes like all the impactful moments like really stick out. Like, because you don't but, like, see standard like getting killed after the robbery from like a mile away. Like that, that's so sudden. Yeah, and like it's also from like a distance too, which makes um when uh Ryan Gosling kicks the dude's uh, head in, also shocking because that time it's a lot more up close and personal. I mean, it, technically you never really see the violence on screen, which also I guess makes it a little bit interesting. I I got really fucked up when I saw Brian Cranston's character die because it's like ah oh, shit. Yeah. Man, like if nobody is um, safe. I mean, uh, for Ryan Gosling, Irene, or Benito. Well, Ryan Gosling, like that's that's still up in the air because like he's still like mortally wounded after his uh fight. I with Bernie. thought he died, but then there there was like five minutes left of the movie. I'm like, like it, it's just that shot of him in the car, and like it's just him with his eyes closed. He's not moving for like thirty seconds, and I'm like, is he dead? And then he opens his eye. Oh no, he's not. Again, it reminds me of the ending of Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Yeah, where he's just <laughs> sitting on the staircase while it's snowing. Yeah, and Sonatine and all that stuff. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's all kind of it's kind of similar. I I feel like this is a movie I need to rewatch. Yeah. Cuz right now I'm just kind of like All right. Um hmm. I mean, I liked it. I'm just it it didn't it didn't really click with me. I'm still trying to get a grasp of what just happened. But uh yeah. Um good movie. I'd recommend it. Would you guys all recommend it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'd probably put Taxi Driver above this personally, but I still had a good time with it. It's just some of the oh, in-between yeah, no. stuff is a little wishy-washy. I like, ta I like Taxi Driver more. Like, i give Taxi Driver, like, a 10. This I'd give, like, an 8. Uh, if what I was going to give, like... I don't know. That's probably, like, an 8, too. A Baby Driver's, like, a, this guy's such a completely different, like, movie, though, so, like, I don't feel it's fair to compare. Like I said, this is low-key Baby Driver. <laughs> All right, so, Patrick, I think it's your turn to recommend. Right. So, I've been thinking about this for a while, and so I'm going to hit you guys with a double whammy, actually. Oh, okay. And I know, I know what one of the movies is, but I'm torn between what I want the second one to be. I have two options, so I'm going to give you a choice, okay? Okay. All right, so the first movie, I'm excited about this, the first movie is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Okay. Okay. And the second movie, I'm torn. It's Do just Chinatown? To... No. So, one movie is a film that is related to Roger Rabbit in a production sense, and the other is a film related to Roger Rabbit in terms of, like, tone and kind of theme. So is Looney Tunes back in is... action or Cool World? Uh, no, it's neither, actually. Interesting, I'm okay. Loop. I'm throwing it for a loop here. So... The one production related is The Thief and the Cobbler, and the one theme related is The Mask. I'm, I'm gonna go The Mask. You say Thief and the Cobbler or The Mask? Let's see. Here's the thing a part of me is leaning. A part of me is leaning towards The Mask, but we already did Jim Carrey, more so. We did Jim Carrey in green. But I think that is like such a great combination. But also the thief and the cobbler movie? is a very also the thief and the cobbler is a very fascinating story. And it Who Friend Roger Rabbit would not exist as it is without the Thief and the Cobbler, and vice versa. So That's I'm like, interesting. I'm, I've never actually seen, seen the Thief and the Cobbler, but I have seen the other two. But at the same time, like I feel like Thief and the Cobbler is like such a big story that could probably almost be like its own thing. Like I feel like it almost distract from the Roger Rabbit talk. I don't know. I thought you were going to say Chinatown, because like a lot of people have often joked that Roger Rabbit is like a kid-friendly remake of Chinatown. Okay, interesting. Here's um, the thing, here's the thing. Um, if we don't pair with either, I do have an alt alternative plans. But if you think The Thief and the Cobbler is big enough, it could be its own thing, I am perfectly fine with that. Yeah, like, I'd rather so, see The Thief and the Cobbler, but I'm, I'm voting for The Mask, just because I think The Mask would fit better. All right, yeah, okay, cool. So we're jumping back to Jim Carrey and Green. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, because I recently saw both of these films again, and I'm like, actually, this would be a fantastic combination, because, you know, the cartoon aesthetic, like the crime stuff. Yeah. 
We could also just I'm, shoot I'm in Son of the Mask and not have to dedicate a full episode about it. It's we're perfect. not doing that. We're exactly. already, we're already talking about we're already talking about Bob Hoskins in a good movie. What do you mean in a good movie? You mean the Super Mask. Mario Bros. movie? No, the Mask. I mean, no, I mean Roger Rabbit. The <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm fucking with you. I, was, I just okay. it's a Bob Hoskins good movie, and I'm like Mario joke. Must make Mario joke now. Make the Mario. joke. All right, so this was It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And now uh, I'm, I'm going to go drive. <laughs>